From Fairfax, Virginia, this is Out of the Past with Chuck Langdon and Lee Shepard, an in-depth discussion with some of the most fascinating people of our time, many of them with strong area connections. Now, today's Out of the Past. Hello and welcome to Out of the Past. Our guest on this program is a radio legend, and he's brought with him photo albums, and microphones and with each of these microphones is a story let's meet granville clink and also joining us to share in these stories is one of our favorite broadcasters lee shepherd i'm just here as uh sitting in the front row seat i'm very very lucky because uh granny as we all knew him as is a, a, a real legend in his own time granny how long have you been a radio engineer well, I started in radio in uh, 1932. Uh, that's the year I uh, passed my federal communications uh, license exam for radio telephone first class license. And of course you needed that to work in radio in those days. Uh, you could not be hired in a station unless you had a license. That is for the technical side. And uh, so uh, that was one of my first uh, entries into the broadcasting business with the license and I was very happy to do that and it took a lot of study and uh, but I enjoyed it and I've enjoyed every minute of it since. Let's get perspective now Chuck. Uh, in 1920, you say you started in 20... 32. 32. Yes. Okay, how old was radio then? Well radio was just kind of coming out of, of the uh, of the woods at that time. The, the networks were beginning to form. There weren't very many big ones. The CBS was around and of course NBC was was the first network uh, by just maybe a year or so, uh, but the, the radio w was starting to pick up, and, uh, and that's what I liked about it. I knew that it was going to be a big success, and that's what I wanted to do. Well, how did you get into business? Well, <clears throat> my first, my very first job before I even had a license was with one of the stations in uh, Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, which was a suburb of Philadelphia, and it was WIBG, and it was owned by St. Paul's Episcopal Church. And the church only used it on Sundays to broadcast their services. So one time the FCC came along and said, look, uh, uh, we, we, uh, you have to have minimum time on the air. I don't think they had any minimum time when they, when they got their license, but CBS, uh, the FCC came up with a, I think it was minimum of four hours a day you had to broadcast uh, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. Of course, the church, uh, hadn't hadn't prepared for that so they felt that uh, it was just too much for them and they I mean, they didn't have a studio we had the transmitter in the basement and we had microphones uh, up in the church and every sunday morning i would go in there and the the choir master would coach me on the pronunciation of the hymns that, that were hard to pronounce and i did the announcing put them on the air shut the station down and that was it how old were you i was about uh, i was about 21 then yeah. <laughs> Goodness sake. Uh, Chuck and I both, I might mention to the audience, that uh, Chuck and I both uh, worked with you in the early 60s. Oh, yeah, Jimmy at, Dean. And the, at yeah. WTOP. And um, Chuck and I both have remarked, and I guess everybody does, you look now exactly like you did in 1964. <laughs> right. And we have some pictures to prove that. that that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, well, I had premature gray hair, but it wasn't as white as it was right then. But, uh, and you're, you're still working. You're yeah, still active. Five days a week, yes. Yeah. Gosh. And with a bellboy, too. Uh, they can't let me go without... They have to have contact with me all the time. Well, let's talk fast in case your bellboy goes off and you <laughs> have to have go somewhere. Today. <laughs> but I can't wait to get to these microphones, Chuck. Yes, let's talk about these take, microphones. Take a shot of these and tell us, Granny, what we are looking at. Well, I think the, the, the biggest uh, mic would be this, this microphone here. This was, it was uh, made by the Western Electric Company. And we used to pick up with the crack of the bat of the Washington Senators baseball games uh, when, in Old Griffith Stadium. And we would set this mic up uh, on the roof and we would uh, orient it to we right on home plate. And that the crack of the bat came through just as clean and clear as you'd want. The microphone is in the back of this device here. And we had, well, this was on a tripod and 
the tripod I couldn't find. So. And it's a bundle of two. Okay, so isn't it? I'm, yeah. I'm going to pick this up. Yeah, pick it up. All right. Now, but nobody would hold, actually hold this. They would oh, be... Oh, no, uh, no. You'd have, to, you'd have to focus it and then leave it there. Focus it. We used to focus okay. it right on home plate. Now, now, that is a microphone. Yes. Now, these tubes are designed for different uh, wavelengths uh, in the sound band so that each, uh, uh, in other words, it, it's a discrete sequen a frequency device picked up by each one of these uh, tubes here. And the mic in the end would be... Uh, picks up then whatever the audio comes through here the microphone picks up so actually I've unscrewed this when you unscrew that it, it looks just about like maybe exactly like this one yes it is that's the same kind yes it is that's a Western Electric 618 that's one of our very famous microphones we use for the Roosevelt pickups and we used it on the dance bands when we picked up the dance bands at night for the network and uh, the only place we didn't use it was studios this was a field type of phone a field type microphone and it worked very good out in the field it, the it, the wind didn't affect this the way it would a, a dynamic a, a ribbon mic right. these dynamic mics were used in the, in the outside so they didn't get all that background uh, the rush of noise and and wind so well you that, mentioned the roosevelt pickups did you work with roosevelt oh yes yes i i was assigned to many of roosevelt's uh, Pickups. I did the fireside chats, and I did the a lot of his electioneering. And during the war, we visited the various uh, military camps throughout the country. We traveled uh, uh, from north to south, and uh, he would talk to the military, and uh, we would uh, follow him around. Sometimes he made a speech from the camp. Sometimes he didn't. And another person that I traveled with at that particular time was Kate Smith. She. Uh, she would en used to entertain the the, the uh, military, and we, we visited a lot of the uh, of the camps uh, in the eastern part of the United States when Kate was uh, doing that. Of course, Roosevelt. I think I did more with Roosevelt, and we did a lot of his electioneering uh, uh, speeches. And uh, from uh, one night, uh, we went up to uh, Fenway Park in in Boston, and it was in November, and we were all standing out there in the middle of this field, freezing. And at 8.30, we heard that the president was on his way, and so he came in at 8.30, riding in an open car with no hat and no coat on. So we, we, he drove out to the pitcher's mound where our microphones were, and while we were setting them up, we, we asked, you know, Mr. President, aren't you cold in this weather? We were freezing. And we, he didn't say very much about it, but we learned after that he had his electric underwear on, run off the car battery. <laughs> You're kidding. That's, that's what we were told. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I know that, that story. That very few Americans knew that he was crippled. Mm -hmm. But yes. uh, I wonder. I, I think even fewer knew he had electric underwear. Yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. Well, there, there was no no photographer would ever uh, photograph Mr. Roosevelt when he was in motion. That was a, a, something that that was a big no no. Was it just agreed upon, or the government say no, you can't? No, do no, it wasn't. It was just a, a gentleman's agreement. That's all. There wasn't any government. In, they didn't get into it. Uh, the, the last time I saw Mr. Roosevelt walk was when he dedicated the Apex Building down at the corner of, of uh, Pennsylvania and, and, Con and Constitution, where they come to a point. That's the Apex Building there. And he dedicated that building one afternoon. And that's the last time I saw him walk. He was walking on two canes with, with his son, Elliot, helping him. So that was it. Did he use this microphone? Yes. You have a photograph in oh, your yes. album. They're all, yes, yeah. I'm sure he used that very one right there. We had about a dozen of those mics, and each each one of us technicians had three or four of them in our carrying bags. And of course, they were they were you know changed around a lot. But I'm sure he was talked to that microphone. Now, actually, I heard that one of the WTOP uh, vice presidents or presidents, Harry Butcher, was the fellow who uh, coined the term fireside chat. Is that myth or real? That's correct. Uh, uh, Harry Butcher was our CBS vice president, and he came with the station uh, when we went on the air with us in 1932. And he, uh, uh, when when the White House uh, talked about the fireside, path, the president talking to the whole nation, he uh, came up with this uh, idea of calling it the fireside chat. He wrote them a little note, and they accepted it. That's the way it started. Hmm. You did a lot of traveling by train back in those days. Oh yes. That was, uh, that was a, a lot of fun traveling by train. The, the Secret Service at that time wouldn't permit the president to fly, and of course, I don't think there was much, uh, many flying machines around then anyway that were 
real uh, st sturdy like they are nowadays. But uh, we uh, we would uh, have to count in when we traveled. We had to count in our traveling time. And remember the the time between Washington and and Warm Springs was 17 hours. So we would leave Washington sometime around. He used to leave, he used to like to leave Union Station around 11 o'clock in the evening. We'd all get on the train there, and then we would go south and and we'd come into. Uh, Warm Springs around eight or nine o'clock in the morning, and the Warm Springs didn't have a have a station in those days. We went into a little town, which was just the other side of Warm Springs, and I can't remember. I don't remember the name of it now. But uh, we, we had to uh, we had to, then we had the the Warm Springs uh, Foundation sent uh, vans for us for all of our equipment, and they uh, uh, drove us into Warm Springs. Sometimes we we are, had quite a a stay down there. One time we were down there for two weeks. And the way we entertained ourselves, we played golf. We had a nine-hole golf course. And that's the last, first and last time I ever played golf. Oh, really? And one thing that we did have that I liked, he had a, a, a swimming pool. That swimming pool had the so-called warm spring water in. And I think the water was something like 80 degrees. And that was set so if you, you could swim underwater and go outside, they had part of the pool outside and part of it inside. So if you wanted to go outside and swim around in November, you could do that. But we stay inside, swim in the pool, and had a lot of fun. Now, you told me a story one time about um, uh, having to race a train, having to do with Roosevelt. <laughs> oh, yeah. what, what was that story? <laughs> oh, well, uh, Mr. The President uh, dedicated the Smoky Mountain National Park in, uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we... Uh, in, in some of these pickups, we had to, to take our own transfer, transportation to get to the pickup point before the president's train did. So we hired a truck and the newsreels and the radio people. There was just two networks, NBC and us. And so we got there and got our, got our old equipment set up. But the problem was sometimes we had, we had to tear the equipment down in a hurry and get on the road before the president started. Because if he beat us at the station, they would, they would wait for us. So we had a truck driver, and we told the truck driver that, that he'd better step on it because we wanted to get to the station first. But on the way, a Tennessee motorcycle policeman was on our tail. So that he caught up with us, and we were yelling back and forth between the truck and the policeman. He said, pull over. We didn't. We said to the truck driver, don't pay any attention to him. We've got to get to the station. <laughs> Easy for you to say. <laughs> yeah. So we'll pay your fine, but just get us to the station. We don't want to miss that train. So we did, we, we beat him, we, we didn't stop, and, but he followed us on in, and we finally got to the station in time. I don't know who paid him, but uh, I think maybe the newsreels, uh, that maybe paid him, I don't know. I know the, the NBC and, and the CBS guy got on the train and forgot about the whole thing, but uh, that was quite a, quite a chase. I think it was some, uh, maybe 25 or 30 miles that we had, to, had this motorcycle cop on our tails. Oh my God. <laughs> Chuck, you know, he has seen he has seen the, the golden days of broadcasting. He was a part of it. He was part inventor of it. Uh, I, I, I am just in awe. Well, I really I, am. When I looked through his, uh, his photo album, he was part of a soap opera. <laughs> Did you know that? that? No. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. Well, in, in, 19, uh, in, the, in the middle 40s, uh, soap operas were starting to come on the network, and there was quite a lot of good soap operas, so our manager felt that we should have a lo local soap, soap opera. So we, we had one, we call, it was called Janice Gray, and it was a good one. We had writers, and we had production people, and we had sound effects. And uh, In fact, on some of those uh, ser series of soap operas, I did the sound effects, too. I was a sound effects man along with my, I just did that on the side. And I belonged after, too, at that time. I had to, to do sound effects. You remember Larry Beckerman? He was, yes. He was one of the producers on the, on the uh, Janice Gray soap opera. I remember it was sponsored by... Bluco, B L U B L U K O, was a soap powder, and was you know, it was really soap soap opera. Bluco, I, I suppose I don't think they're I haven't seen their ads for a long time, so they're probably not in business anymore. Yeah. But uh, that was a good, uh, no, a long going soap opera and did very well. Radio had a lot of uh, variety in those days. Didn't it? Yes, they did. Uh, in the early day, earlier radio days, a radio station was something for everybody. It was, it was something that it just it commanded an audience uh, all over the, all the time they were on the air. There weren't any so-called formats like they have now. Of course, there's nothing wrong with them either, but uh, the whole industry has changed it around to this uh, 
a lot of format, but there's still stations that are that are not conforming to restricted to formats that are on the air now. Would you mention some of the people that, that you worked with, some names that uh, the, the older older folks would know, uh, maybe the younger people wouldn't, but uh, uh, Lowell Thomas, for example? Yeah, well, yeah. I used to work with Lowell Thomas. Uh, Lowell was, was traveling around quite a bit when he was doing his news, and uh, if he wanted to come to Washington some night, he would call me a couple of days ahead of time and tell me where he was going to be, and then, then I would order a circuit, telephone circuit in, in from the, his remote point to our master control room. Then we would send the man out. Sometimes I went to do his, uh, his show, and uh, other times he did it from the studios, right in, in the Earl Theater building, and uh, uh, it, everything worked out very well. He had a favorite hotel down at the, uh, he was in the, in the, he used to stay in the Mayflower Hotel, and when he came to town, he would invite us down to breakfast, and then we would talk over what he was going to do, and the, he would buy our breakfast for us, and very nice guy he was. Did he have a particular microphone, or did these people... Oh, we used these microphones, so these 618s, yeah, yeah. That was a very, 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 and still is a very good mic, in my opinion. And as I say, we could use them under most every condition, almost underwater. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. How about Arthur Godfrey? Did you yeah. work with him? Oh, yeah, Arthur, uh, uh, when I came to town in, in 37, I remember coming to work, my uh, first day to work, driving my Plymouth from... I, I, got a, I lived in a room on Massachusetts Avenue, 17th in Massachusetts, where the Brookings Institute is now. They, they must have torn down my uh, uh, boarding house and put the Brookings Institute up there. <laughs> 1771 Mass. I listened to Godfrey. And play, and of course, in those days, they played their own records before the Union came into the station. But after that, I, I used to swim with Godfrey's records for him. <clears throat> we hooked up his farm. He did some of his, Every Friday, he went down to the farm to do his record show. And then we, we hooked it up for television. We put in cameras and but see he had a he had a, an ice rink there, he had a skate chute, he had a swimming pool, and we hooked up all facilities so we could broadcast from any one of those uh, points. And uh, he did one of his big ice shows from down there. The, the problem with the ice palace, the ice palace, whatever it was, <clears throat> the, the ceiling wasn't high enough for lighting. So we had we this was I guess it was maybe twice as long as this studio here. Mm -hmm. So what we had to do, we raised the roof 10 feet. So we just chopped the, chopped the top of the thing off and put the roof up 10 feet for the lighting. It worked out very well. Wow. How did you make the transition from radio to television? You were chief engineer for, for both, and, and FM, AM, FM, and TV for so many years. Um, was that was that uh, a difficult transition for you to make? No, it was very easy because uh, television, the equipment wasn't it wasn't that different. Everything was tubes, and if you knew if you knew vacuum tubes, you were well along the uh, in working with television, uh, and uh, we didn't have it really any problem uh, it, it adapting from one to the other at all. We used the same same microphone. In fact, television used a lot of our equipment in the early days before they got started. I mean, before they really. We're on their own. We, they used all these microphones. And they used our studios, too. I'd like to go back to Arthur Godfrey mm -hmm. stories. Who were some of the, the crew you worked with on that program? Arthur Godfrey? Well, uh, you mean he, down in Washington? Were some of the engineers that would go out to the farm, and you remember any of those? Uh, yes, we had a, a man, and Harry Menifee was one of the uh, Godfrey crew, and uh, Brian Wright was another Godfrey crew. And uh, Don Saunders was a Godfrey man, and of course I worked with him. Uh, I guess at one time or other, maybe uh, some of the studio men, a lot of the studio men were assigned to studio, but Godfrey was kind of a separate studio, which required more than the average uh, studio man. You had to know Godfrey's, Godfrey's idiosyncrasies and how he was set up and what he would do in the middle of a show and the, what kind of a, what he did on the microphone. And, but. Uh, there was four or five of us that worked the Godfrey show, either in the studio or down at the farm. And what what is the the peach orchard broadcast? What the peach orchard? In your oh, album, the, there's a picture. Oh, that was down on on the mall. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I thought was that was a, on the farm. In fact, uh, that, that that was I think the the, the cherry tree blossoming blossoming. That's oh, that okay. Was, taken. was that an annual book? Well, we we did that a couple of times. Godfrey used to get out in the public uh, like that. He wanted to, to do things that were out of the studio, and uh, 
And uh, so we, we used to go down there every once in a while in the springtime, and, uh, of course, on the farm. And, uh, and we would uh, do something maybe from the pool. And, uh, and he had, you know, he had, uh, he had uh, I think, eight or ten horses. He had a large barn with all these horses. And one of the animals he had down there, which ran loose, was, a, was an antelope. And this antelope was very friendly. And you were, if you're standing there talking in a group, this antelope would come up and he would nudge you in the back. <laughs> it scared you. You'd wonder, what, what is hitting me in the back? <laughs> Very friendly animal. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. And he had, a, he had a baby elephant down there one time. And I think one of the uh, officials from India gave him. And uh, of course, he had the horses. And his, had his famous horse, Goldie. And that was a show horse. He did, uh, Goldie used to do tricks. And Goldie was used on some of his first television shows, and he went on the air in 1957 from the farm. And that's when we used to do the talent scouts from down there, and Goldie used to perform a bit, and it worked out very well. Now, of course, when you were talking about the studio, <clears throat> uh, let me reiterate, if you've mentioned this before, I don't think you have, uh, where the studio was. It was in the Warner Building. Warner, Earl, well, it was the Earl Building then. Oh, oh. Earl Building became Warner Building, and I'm not exactly sure when that date was, but when I was there in 1937, it was still the Earl Building. Now, it may have come, become the Warner Building maybe in the early 40s. I don't, I don't remember. But it's still there, isn't it? Yes, yeah, still there. Yeah. We had five studios on, on the eighth floor, and, uh, of course, the, the, uh, the studios weren't that big. Uh, we had one large studio which we used uh, for some of the bigger bands. We had Fred Waring in there one, one time. We had it when we, I think we were probably one of the first that had the, uh, uh, what, uh, put in disc recorders. The Presto disc recorders, you remember them? 16 inch discs? Yes, yes I do. And one, one day, I did a, a three day uh, job with, for Fred Waring and his, his chorus and his band in our big studio. And we recorded all that material on, on these uh, 16 inch discs. And I worked with Fred for those three days and it turned out very well. Now, by recording, you actually cut yeah, they, yeah, the was, grooves in the disc. That's right. It was, that's, we had a, a, a diamond stylus which cut the groove, and, and the, the head was on a moving device which, which 120 lines per inch had cut in this disc. Now, this, this head moved that speed so it would cut in, a, in a one inch it cut 120 lines and uh, you get 15 minutes on one disc mm. Mm. you could cut it inside out or outside in and when you, we had also you had to so the thread wouldn't get tangled up in the stylus we had a little device to, to block the to stop the thread from going around and we would push it off to the side so that was one of the things we had to be careful of if it Thread ever got into the stylus, you usually lifted it out of the groove, and then you had a problem getting that fixed. Right, right. <laughs> Arthur Godfrey had some fun with your name. He wrote a note to you, didn't <laughs> he? Did, didn't he? <laughs> well, what was that about? <laughs> oh, he used to tell me about my name. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Granville Clink is not a, is not a name that's well known, <laughs> and that name was was my grandfather. Uh, was a, it's a British name, Granville, it was a Sir Granville somewhere. I don't know whether I was connected with it or not, but he, uh, I was given that name, and my, it was, I'm a junior, my father was that name also. So uh, they, uh, he got a lot of kick with that. And, uh, in fact, the, the letter was, uh, he was appearing in one of his tapes on, I think I saw that on Channel 5 one, one night. And I think he did a lot, some of those shows for the military. And I think this is one of those shows. And I wrote him a little note saying, gee, I'm sorry I haven't seen you or heard from you late, later, Arthur. Well, how are you doing? And so then he, he wrote me the letter that uh, right. I saw there. And we have a picture I prized of that. that letter. Uh, I, I was the man I, I wrote to him. But I'm sorry that uh, he, he, he uh, when he went to New York, uh, I think uh, uh, at the end of the television, his television shows, he was looking for a, a new a new kind of a show, and he was, he was talking to Pat Boone. And Pat Boone was advising him on, on on a particular type of show that that he was going to do. And in, in August of, of 19, uh, it was 1949 uh, or 15 or 59. He he appeared at on Channel 9 on their morning shows, 
and we all went over to see him and, and we spent some time with him afterwards and uh, he had uh, he told us about his what he was trying to do and the, but uh, the people were apparently didn't want didn't want to take a chance on what he was what he was going to do we never found out what he was really going to do in the way of a new type of television show so I think that was his kind of his swan song he, I think he, he was a little disappointed in that he didn't get back in the television You've got to come back. We can't cover this. <laughs> 30, how many years? 30? Uh, 57. 57. Will, 30 as chief engineer at WCA. 27 as chief engineer, yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's almost 30. Yeah, that's almost and, 30. And then, my gosh, that is unbelievable. <laughs> and I think this microphone here is a good example of when you were saying the transition between radio and TV. Because we used to see this mic all the time in the early television shows. On a boom, yeah. We used it as a boom mic, yes. Right. At the 77D, RCA yes, 77D. Yes. There was a C and a D, and a, uh, I think the, the I forget, I forgot what the, what the C did, but the D has the three patterns, the, the omnidirectional, piece of pie, and the, and the figure eight. Mm -hmm. This has been fascinating. <laughs> Chuck, let's can, get him can back. Can you come back? Would you join <laughs> us again? I sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. Well, we'll continue the discussion. We have more microphones, more stories. We want to talk about WTOP and the days at WTOP. All right. Thank you, Grant. Thank you very much for having me. And, uh, very enjoyable. A phrase that almost causes an automatic reaction in a radio engineer. We'll be right back after this short message. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us yes. on Out of the Past. Glad well, to be here. Thank you very much.